It's now my distinct pleasure to welcome our opening keynote speaker to kick off the summit. Someone who truly embodies the spirit of ARPA-E, boldly exploring the known, unknown and pushing the limits of innovation. Now, while ARPA-E is focused on energy and discovering new energy technologies and moving those to, to the marketplace, Dr. Sylvia Earle has been a pioneer and an innovator exploring some of the deepest and unknown parts of the ocean. She truly is a kindred spirit. Called Her Deepness by the New York Times and named Time Magazine's first hero of the planet, Sylvia Earle led more than 100 expeditions as an oceanographer, including leading the first team of women, aquanauts, to live in one of the first undersea research laboratories and setting a depth record for open ocean diving. She is formerly the chief scientist of NOAA and is now an explorer in residence at the National Geographic Society, a title I would really love to hold. Isn't that cool? Um, She's going to be talking to us today um, about a subject that I would call uh, no blue, no green. Uh, the fact that our oceans um, are very, very important reflectors of what's going on in the world. She's the founder of Mission Blue and the Sea Alliance and a founding ocean elder. It is my honor and pleasure to welcome Dr. Sylvia Earle. What a pleasure to be here with you in Washington, D.C., huh. for some, the center of the universe. I would like to add a subtitle to the title, No Blue, No Green. Uh, no blue, no green, no blue, no us. Water, water is the key. It's the key to a world that works in our favor. Think of the alternative. We have the blue planet. We look at the red one and are aspiring to go there and will one day have human footprints on the red planet if we keep our act together. To do so, we have to take our life support system with us. Earth, we have one that is built in. And it starts with the water. No water, no life. The poet Auden put it very clearly, many have lived without love, none without water. <laughs> and that's it. Scientists at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution have done this little amazing calculation of taking all the water, all the water in the world, and making a little ball of it. That's all the oceans, all the water that there is in the skies above, in the rivers, the lakes, the streams, and it doesn't look like very much if you spread it out over the whole surface, at least two-thirds of the surface of the water, of the, of the planet. And of all of that water, the average depth of the ocean, it's four kilometers, maximum 11 kilometers. Seems like a lot. We thought there was so much that the ocean was too big to fail. Now we have learned otherwise. Just in the course of my time exploring the ocean, we have learned more, but at the same time, we have lost more of the natural functioning systems that make the planet, make the ocean work in our favor. Only about 3% of all that water, such as it is, is fresh water. The majority of that is locked in polar ice, most of it in Antarctica. Only a fraction of the fresh water that is a part of that ball of total water, including the water that's in all of us and all the other living things on Earth. You know, it isn't much in the greater scheme of things. There's water elsewhere in the universe. We have a lot of liquid water that makes our planet work in our favor. In times ahead, and even right now, we're beginning to recognize the importance of water. What is it that they say in the West? 
Whiskey's for drinking, <laughs> water's for fighting, <laughs> fighting over water. Well, we're seeing that begin to really be a serious issue. That tiny fraction of all the water that is fresh water that drives and powers our existence. Two years ago, I had a chance to reflect on the magnitude of change that has taken place since I began diving in the 1950s. At about the same time that I was learning to dive, this bird, this Laysan albatross, was learning to fly. Now, I'm a little bit older than that bird, but imagine that in her 60s, she continues to produce offspring. And they face an uncertain future, given the changes that have taken place. We anticipate a prosperous future, because with seven billion of us, with seven billion brains, we have the power, maybe, to figure things out the way no other creatures on the planet can. There's some smart ones out there, including birds that can survive for decades. They have to have something going for them to be able to withstand the pressures of life in the 21st century. Elephants are smart, but they're having a hard time. Dogs, cats, horses, a lot of intelligent creatures. But we have the edge of being able to look back in time, draw on all preceding history. It has gotten us to where we are and can, if we keep our wits about us, propel us into a prosperous future or not, depending on what we do or fail to do. So most of the people in this room were around. Some of you were not. When the Apollo moon launch took place in 1969, that was the year that I first heard about an experiment living underwater and was able to become an aquanaut at the same time that there were astronauts flying up in the sky. No women astronauts at that time. But think of what's happened since then. 1969, 1970, we're looking at an era of exceptional development of technologies, exceptional new insights into big questions like, who are we as humans? Where do we come from? Most importantly, where are we going? Kids walk around, and you do too, you know, big kids, with information in your pocket that transcends anything that even the smartest people who have ever lived before the middle of the 20th century could not know, could not access. Imagine if Galileo or Copernicus had access to the kinds of information that 10-year-olds now can pull out of the sky and into their minds. We are truly blessed with the capacity to understand who we are, where we come from, where are we going. We can communicate with many of those seven billion minds that are now populating Earth. We have the power of knowing as never before. As never before, we have that edge. We can see how the world connects, not just people, but the natural systems. And maybe, just maybe, we're beginning to understand that everything we care about is dependent on taking care of the natural systems powered by water, powered by life, that makes our lives possible. We can see the connections. We can be up in the sky above where birds fly to see how the sands of Africa wash across in the sky, across the, the ocean, to land on us here in Washington, D.C. We have the power of being high in the sky and measuring not just guesswork, not just a hypothesis, but looking at the evidence of what's happening to the world. Unprecedented speed of environmental change. In the skies above, in the polar ice, measurements that started back in 1980, just 1980, to see and measure the scale of the loss of ice in the Arctic and in the Antarctic. Bad news for creatures in both polar areas. Bad news for polar bears, but good news for shipping. Huh. We can fly across the top of the world. We can also ship things now very soon and just beginning across the top of the world. 
that looks like great news for business. And in some ways, it is. But we have to think of things in perspective and understand the consequences of what our actions are doing to change the nature of nature. We're seeing, and we can measure, we can scale, we can understand that we are influencing climate and weather through what we're putting into the atmosphere, what we're putting into the ocean, what we're doing to the fabric of life that keeps us alive. We can measure now the only creatures on Earth. Fish can't do it, birds can't do it, whales can't do it, but we can measure the scale of what's happening to entire ecosystems, such as coral reefs. I have personally been around and witnessed a decline of about 50%, about half the coral reefs are either gone from the time I began diving and that Laysan albatross began flying. The good news is about half of them are still in pretty good shape. Half of them are succumbing to effects such as coral bleaching driven by a warming ocean, driven by a loss of the fish and other wildlife that once populated these systems and maintained complete integrity. There are new things in the ocean since I began diving and that bird began flying. Plastics, I come from the pre-plasticozoic. Some of the rest of you have too. And I have to say, I love plastics. I love my Ziplocs. I love the plastics that are on my computer and buttons on my coats and things of that sort. It isn't plastic that's the problem. It's what we do with it, the single-use plastics that we just burn through and throw away, and they wind up in the ocean. The ocean has never had this as something to deal with until right about now. The last 50 years have seen more change in the ocean, in the world as a whole, than during all preceding human history. Well, we're witnesses. We're right at the center of action. An engineer might call this the sweet spot in time, because never before have we been able to know or see what's going on on the scale that we now can. And therefore, identifying what the problems are, we have the power, you have the power, kids have the power to do something about it. Now, this is one of the, the albatross's neighbors who, had, instead of having a traditional nest out there uh, in a clump of grass, has chosen to sit in a pile of plastic that has come ashore halfway across the Pacific on Midway Island. So we're putting a lot of things in the ocean that the ocean has never had to deal with before. Seven billion people generate a lot of stuff that ultimately winds up through groundwater, in the sky, however it gets there, the ocean is the ultimate sewer as well is the ultimate source of life. We're very good at taking from the ocean. <laughs> Just look at this, the little map that some scientists have put together just to look at where the fish used to be. This is when my father was born, 1900. Fish were plentiful. We had already diminished some. Cod were already showing signs of our appetite and our ability to catch them. But nothing like what's happened in the 20th century. Here we are, 2000. All of those great populations of coastal fish that powered our civilization to some extent as commodities, as food from the sea, now greatly depleted. 90% of many of the fish that once were common, including cod, including swordfish, tunas, Sharks, just, you know, what do you love to eat? They are in a state of decline because we are so good at finding them, catching them, and marketing them all over the world. We're at a point where we have to really think about the value of those creatures. We used to take birds from the sky commercially. Passenger pigeons once were like rivers of life in the sky. Even in the late 1800s, 
tiptoeing into the early part of the 20th century. And then, boom, gone. I mean, gone, gone. Ducks, geese, many of the wild birds, we used to eat them in large scale quantities, but not anymore. We have found it necessary to protect what it takes to make birds if we want birds at all. Their numbers are way down from what they were a century ago. They're coming back in some areas because we've taken actions to bring them back. But with fish, huh, we're still amping up the pressure on taking wildlife from the sea. We're really, really good at catching wildlife from the sea. We're too good at catching wildlife from the sea. If we are to have fish to eat, if there are to be fishermen, there have to be fish. If there are to be fish, there have to be places where fish can do what it takes to make fish. Now we, I mean, we understand that with birds, now we have to understand that with fish as well. The destructive ways that we are extracting from the sea need to be understood. I am a witness. I've been down in the deep sea looking where trawls have scraped the ocean floor. I've seen the before and after. I want you to see it too. So you really appreciate that halibut, that whatever it is that you munch on so casually. Popcorn shrimp, shrimp this, shrimp that, forest gump. I mean, think of all the ways you can prepare shrimp, but think of what it really costs to get those shrimp out of the ocean or even farm shrimp. There is a cost we have not been really accounting for. And so this is the moment. Wake up. Use our brains. Understand. Fish aren't free. We need to account for them. As chief scientist of NOAA, I got into some trouble because I pointed out that fish have an accounting base of zero when they're swimming around in the ocean. Shrimp too, lobsters. But they're not really free. I mean, we, we should be extracting something from the big balance sheet when we take them out of the ocean instead of just saying that they're free. But it isn't just the shrimp that we put on our cocktails and whatever. We're taking shrimp from thousands of miles away in Antarctica, the krill that we don't even eat. We grind them up to feed the cows and chickens and pigs. Sharks. We used to think of them as the bad guys. <laughs> the ultimate predator, but guess what? We are the altissimo predator. Used to be worried about man-eating sharks. Well, it's man-eating sharks and shark fins for shark fin soup. Again, we're so good at killing them. We need to think more about what they're really worth. Every fish, every whale, every bit of plankton is a carbon-based unit. We used to think of whales primarily as commodities. Some nations still do. But we've come to think of other values. We look now at the ocean, as well as the land, as sources of energy to power our mighty civilizations. And by way of disclosure, I've served on the board of a number of energy companies, Oryx Energy, Dresser Industries, Kerr McGee. I have such respect for what it takes, the skill to actually drill down into the ocean or into the land to extract fossil fuels that have gotten us to where we are today. But Earth never looked like this before in all of our history. It's only now, only now. We take it for granted, turn on the lights, fly across the, from one part of the planet to the other. But going forward, we are going to continue drawing on fossil fuels. Whatever the level is, this is just an educated guess, with still dependence on fossil fuels, with an increasing interest in other ways of powering our civilization as our population continues to grow. But think about it. This week, out in California, The Economist is hosting an ocean forum to think about these issues, to think about energy, to think about food, to think about who are we? Where did we come from? Where are we going? The Economist. This past year, the World Bank has fostered a look at the ocean with how do we invest in the ocean in ways that do not just eat the assets, take the assets, but protect the assets and see them grow. Recognize that a powerful new forces, it isn't just what we take out of the ocean. Tourism is becoming one of the biggest economic drivers 
of ocean interests in the world right now. It isn't just the big ships, it's you know, people such as I who just love to go splash around, go diving, beaches, boating, many things. Feeding people is really an issue. The carbon cycle is really an issue. Generating oxygen is really an issue. And until right about now, we have neglected the ocean on the balance sheet. We're beginning to respect mangroves with their roots, with seagrass meadows, with marshes that really are responsible pound for pound, acre for acre, of generating more oxygen, gathering more carbon out of the atmosphere, and turning it into food than the rainforests. We need the rainforests, but we also need to think about those ocean creatures as well. New on the horizon, a new way of looking at the ocean. Here it is. Remember this word, prochlorococcus. Mwahaha. <laughs> Those little tiny organisms, so small that they were not discovered until 1985 by scientists from MIT and Woods Hole exploring the ocean and finding that 20% of the oxygen in the atmosphere comes from a little organism that is so small that it was escaping the notice of all previous explorations until 1985, and now we know. One in every five breaths you take are generated by these little tiny creatures that live in the ocean all over the world. Vulnerable to changing chemistry, of course. They're bacteria, cyanobacteria, photosynthetic bacteria that do the heavy lifting in terms of keeping us with the air we breathe. And they also feed microorganisms in the sea, little guys that in turn, as small as they are, feed some of the big things. I think that's my signal. <laughs> Give me one more minute, and I will <laughs> end this on a happy note. Because just as we're going high in the sky, and we are going deep in the sea, we have, at this point in history, an unprecedented opportunity over the past 10,000 years, we have lived in a moment of prosperity, relative, relative calm in the greater scheme of things. Earth has not always been that way. It has been up and down in cycles that would not be hospitable for us. Think about what you, as engineers, as entrepreneurs, as scientists, as human beings on Earth at this unprecedented time in history, the power that you have to shape not just the next 10 years, not just the next 20, but what we do or what we fail to do in our time will shape the next 10,000 years. Never before have we had a time of such opportunity, of such challenge, maybe, as never again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Thank you for joining us. Okay, thank this you. This was really wonderful. Thank you so much.